It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by SubashTechnosis.com. If you go to SubashTechnosis.com, they can help you with any kind of a, a website design, search engine optimization, uh, uh, content writing, data entry, uh, press releases. They can even uh, help you out with your um, customer service. If you have a website and you want little one of those little chat boxes to do customer service for you, SubashTechnosis.com. You can also find them on Facebook at Subash Technosis LLC. If you contact them, make sure you mention Ed Opperman. I've known Subash for 10 years, and that's how you get a good deal. Okay, we got a, a really special show today. We have Lynn Albrecht. She's the mother of Ross Albrecht, who was convicted on charges related to Silk Road. Uh, you might remember Silk Road. That was the, the big heyday back in the, the deep web, the dark web. It was like a an open market bazaar where you can pretty much get anything you wanted. And uh, she's associated with the website freeross.org. Uh, so, Lynn, are you there? Yeah, I am. Oh, thank, Hi. Thank God. We got you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got it. It worked this time. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Tell us about yourself. Uh, who, who is Lynn Albrecht? Well, I'm uh, a regular person who uh, has been – catapulted into this bizarre world of the dark net, uh, encryption, legal issues, um, fighting for my son because he had an unfair trial. I'm very clear on that. Um, media, you know, it's just been, I've been catapulted here and um, I'm just doing my best to bring awareness to this case because I've had my eyes opened by dealing directly with how the government operates, and I, frankly, have been appalled and shocked at it. I um, had no idea that this is how the government operated in the criminal justice system. And um, since then, I've, I've gotten a lot more, um, you might say cynical. I'm not as surprised anymore, but I, I, I was very shocked. Uh, so I've been on a very steep learning curve about all of this, and um uh, and, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm raising awareness and funds for my son's defense. That's really what I'm, I've been dedicated to for three years now. Yeah, and But also the big picture, I really want to make that point, because since my eyes have been opened so, you know, directly, I realize this is a much bigger problem. And um, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, bigger issues at stake here. And so I, I'm, my hope and intention is that this, that Ross's case will shine a spotlight on that and that this can be used for a positive outcome, both for him and just to raise awareness so people realize what's happening to our constitutional protections because they're not being honored. Yeah, until you've been the target of a federal prosecution or, or even a yeah. witness, you know, you can even be a witness, a defense witness or a prosecution witness. And until you, you experience the full power of the federal government coming down upon you, uh, it's not what you think it is. It's, it's a lot more intense. And the prosecution uh, rate, the conviction rate in a federal case is in the upper 90s. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an uphill. It's an uphill battle. Uh, right. I think it's 99 percent, but only 3 percent of people actually go to, go to trial. trial. We're losing yeah. our jury trials in this country. Most people are pressured to plea. And they're penalized for going to trial if they're not exonerated. And um, frankly, from my son's trial, I feel like it was um, very much manipulated and unfair. And I and he's not unique, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's a very small percentage of people uh, actually win at a trial these days. That's so true. And now uh, tell us about Ross. Yeah, well, Ross, and, and, you know, we have a whole section in our freeross.org thing about a uh, site about him personally because we had a hundred people who know him personally right into the judge asking her because he got a double life sentence 
plus 40 years for all nonviolent charges. And 100 people wrote very moving letters, which are posted on our site, about who Ross really is and not the government narrative of who they say he is based on what I consider, well, what a lot of people consider very flimsy evidence because it was digital but in, and very easily manipulated. But in any case, Ross, um, you know, he's a, he's a very um, humanitarian person. He's uh, worked for charities. He's do- donated in his book business um, percentage of his profits to charity. He's, uh, as, uh, he's an Eagle Scout. He loves nature. He's a real nature boy, which part of this is so heartbreaking because he's been basically in a metal He's been in a detention center that the U.N. has ranked as torture. So he he doesn't get outside much. Um, He was an academic honor student and scholarship recipient and um, got a a bachelor's in physics and went on to get his master's in material science. He's very much of a freedom-loving person in terms of philosophy. He worked on the Ron Paul campaign. He um, got very enthusiastic about Ron Paul and, um, you know, uh, Austrian economics in in graduate school. And that really became his passion and free market. Um, But he's never been a drug person. He's He's a scholarship student. He's never been into drugs or even talked about them or cared about them. It, it, you know, he, but he has been into libertarian ideals and free markets and very passionate about that. Um, you know, and of course, our whole family, my, my immediate family as well as our extended family has stood behind him. His friends have stood behind him. People, inmates in the prison have written letters on his behalf because he's helped them so much in there. He's tutored them uh, for the, to get their GED. He helped a few of them get into college um, online. He's conducted classes. He's informally tutored individuals. He's been a real model prisoner in that sense because he has a lot of compassion for people. Um, So there's a whole list of of things on our website as well as those letters and testimonials from people who know Ross. And everybody says, you know, wait a second, this guy doesn't need to be in prison. He's not a danger to anyone. And there's a lot of questions about how the prosecution painted him at trial and how the judge painted him at sentencing as well. Well, why don't you give us an idea? What what was Silk Road? What was it about? Well, um, I thought Reason Magazine gave a really good definition, um, which is a little more objective than some of it, which is, and you kind of touched on this, um, that it was really a... It was a dark web site, meaning you couldn't just go on the Internet. It wasn't easy to get to. It was on the, operated on the Tor router, which means the Onion router, um, which I, I've never really – I'm not very adept at. I've never really used. Yeah, I, but, you know, I guess you can get on there, and everything is anonymous when you get on there. So your browsing history um, is not readily available to the government, which I think is um, actually – a lot of journalists use it. Dissidents in other countries use it. It's not necessarily nefarious, although the prosecution in their papers in this case said anyone who uses it has criminal intent. Mm. Well, that's simply not true. Um, but the site was based on a libertarian. Go ahead. No, no I was listening. Go ahead. Oh, uh, based on a libertarian philosophy, uh, which was free markets, where people could trade. What was known as bit was known as Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency. Uh, it's a digital currency, and there's a debate in the government whether it's even money for a variety of goods. Yes, not all of them were legal at all, but there were restrictions. Which since then, there's been a proliferation of these dark websites that have no restrictions, as far as I know. I don't go on them. I've never been on Silk Road, but there were no, um, there was no, there was nothing violent. There were no, there was no child pornography allowed. There was no um, stolen property allowed. I mean, there were restrictions, uh, but drugs were allowed. And many libertarians think that's a choice, and the Silk Road administrators um, thought so too. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm not out there defending drug use or, or even Silk Road. But um, that was the philosophy of the site. Now, Ross was one of the, the people who was using the moniker uh, dreaded, pi- uh, 
Dread, Dread Pirate Roberts, Roberts in the movie. Yeah, right. Well, that actually has not been established. Um, he's pleading guilty, uh, not guilty, excuse me. He's pleading not guilty, or he pled not guilty. Um, there's lots of anecdotal evidence that there were many Dread Pirate Roberts, people using that name. Uh, whether Ross did, or what he said was that he um, was not involved in being Dread Pirate Roberts. So, which which actually came in later in the site's existence. It was um, something that, you know, it sequentially happened when it was bigger and more organized. Um, his lawyer said at trial that he created the idea and then got out and was set up later. And I believe that's true. Um, but I don't know. I don't have any real personal, factual, definite information that that's true. But... Um, it makes sense to me. Um, and so he, whether or not he was actually the Dread Pirate Roberts, or even if there was only one, which most people say there weren't many. And that would be typical of the Internet and typical of these, um, you know, names that they take, is that it's just a, a name that people use to be anonymous. And people... I don't know if you've heard of the movie Deep Web, but it was made about the dark net, and Ross was featured, and Silk Road was featured, and they went into the inside of Deep Web to talk to people who had been high-level admins on Silk Road, and they all say, oh, yeah, there were lots of DPRs. They call it DPRs, you know, right. shortcut, but there were lots of them. And there was even and there was even evidence at trial. One of the main investigators who was on the site for two years and thousands of hours said he believed there was more than one, that there were several. And there was other evidence that the jury was not allowed to hear that there was more than one, probably several. And and in a way it makes sense because basically it's like saying Jeff Bezos runs everything about Amazon and, you know, from a cafe on his laptop. I mean, basically that's what they're saying, and it's just not possible. And I've talked to programmers who say there's no way, especially they're dubious because of Ross's lack of uh, computer skills in terms of that level. He didn't study computer science. He studied physics and material science. I'm not saying he doesn't know stuff. I mean, certainly knows a lot more than I do, but everybody his age does. But um, it wasn't something he was particularly advanced in. Well, let me ask you this. So the thing they did the whole thing is just yeah, but uh, ludicrous, really. Dur during this time, okay, when he was running, when he was involved with with Silk Road, uh, yeah. what was he telling his family that he was doing for a living? Well, I don't know how much he was involved with Silk Road. Okay, <laughs> but uh, but as far as what we know, um, Ross is, was involved in um, uh, Bitcoin. He really was interested in Bitcoin. He was interested in creating a Bitcoin exchange. He um, was working in various political things like Ron Paul's campaign. Um, I certainly, this was all totally shocking to me when I when it all hit the news and all of that, and we were informed. Uh, you know, I, I, it, I, we had no, this was totally new. This was completely unexpected and shocking. I'm still kind of have to wake up in the morning and go, is this, is this real? I mean, seriously, is this real? So um, Ross has always been a wonderful son. He's been a great, um, you know, lovable person, easygoing and um, peaceful. And I, I, the descriptions I've read about him are just, well, really ridiculous. So, so then what, what is the prosecution's theory of this case? What, what was he charged with? Well, yeah, it, well, those are two questions. But um, yeah. he basically was charged at trial with narcotics trafficking and then narco well they had they had a lot more charges or a few more charges at trial which they were redundant and so then at sentencing they brought it down to five uh and apparently i've been told the government will do that they'll pile on all these different ways to say the same charge so that it sounds worse than it even is um so the jury's more overwhelmed but um in any case they had more charges at trial but ultimately he was sentenced for narcotics trafficking uh, money laundering, not that they said he money laundered money, but that people on the site did. They were holding him responsible for everything that happened on the site, um, which is a whole other thing we can talk about. The precedent was established there, which is quite right. alarming. Um, 
uh, computer hacking, not that he hacked anything, but that some people sold uh, software that could be used for that on the site. Um, making false IDs, again, not that he did it. And then the other one was a continuing criminal enterprise, which is basically the kingpin charge, which is usually reserved for, you know, Chapo and Pablo Escobar and violent kingpins who are handling deals and organizing specific people. And it actually, the statute requires that um, the prosecution names specific people. They never did. They were never able to name anyone that this alleged kingpin was organizing, supervising, or managing. And yet, he was convicted and sentenced on that, and that's got its own life sentence. And a lot of what they were basing on is the volume. Well, the Internet has a way of you know, reaching a lot of people. So it's, it's, it's making it sound like it's equivalent to Pablo Escobar selling that you know, hands-on drugs kind of thing, or even not hands-on, but organizing people. And Silk Road was completely vendor and buyer-driven. It, was, it wasn't managed hands-on by anyone. It was... I assume it was automated, but it's kind of like um, eBay, eBay, yeah. or yeah, Craigslist, or uh, eBay. By the way, which someone made the point just the other day, sells combat knives, and so if someone buys one and then kills somebody with it, so is the CEO of eBay liable? Because that's really the question in this case. A lot of it is called transferred intent, where and the go- and it's not just internet sites, although they're very vulnerable to this, because a lot of times they don't know what's on their site, or even they do know what's on their site, but they're, you know, turning a blind eye, or they're allowing it, but they're not actually doing it. And so, but uh, with Fed- Federal Express was federally indicted, criminally indicted by the government for um, uh, drug trafficking, because people used it to uh, ship uh, illegal pharmaceuticals. Federal Express. And so they're using this theory of transferred intent, which is extraordinarily expansive, to say, well, you know, you're not only responsible for what you directly do, but you're responsible for what other people do. That, that's and so there's an argument there that it's a slippery slope. Yeah, because there is legal precedent where, where ISPs and chat rooms and these are held harmless uh, if there's any kind of uh, defamation or, or, or slander within their – yeah. yeah. Right. That's correct. If this were a civil case and Ross are being sued, he would be it would be thrown out instantly because it's civil. They're making it criminal and that the the, the worry of some people is that it could be a slippery slope into the criminal um and, and journalists have written about it, uh saying this could put a chill on the internet. If this kind of precedent goes forward, it's like, well, how much risk is one person one website host willing to take? An example of this exact thing. Amazon is being sued by a mother of a girl who bought cyanide on Amazon. Mm. They no longer sell it, but they did up until uh, a few years ago. And she killed herself with it. And the mother's suing Amazon and the vendor. And it's exactly the same thing. Amazon knew they were selling cyanide. Cyanide killed this girl, allegedly, you know, that she got it from Amazon. And Jeff Bezos is not in court. It's, It's, you know... The, theory, the precedent is somewhat troubling, say the least. Let me ask you another question. Now, so, uh, in, in, in these kind of drug conspiracy cases, there's always that yeah. scene in the courtroom where they, they bring in the suitcases full of drugs and they throw it down on the table. There it is. Was there any uh, mm-hmm. evidence like that, any kind of the actual product brought into court? No. There was no product. There was no one coming forward to say they were a victim uh, at trial. Um, no. There, there was no, there was none of nothing tangible. And in fact, the evidence itself, ninety nine percent of it was digital, which means chats, screenshots, um, you know, digital information that I've been told over and over again, and is pretty well established that it's very vulnerable to tampering, planting, um, editing, you know, all you know, all kinds of uh, tampering, and other courts have thrown it out. And in fact, a mortgage company won't accept a screenshot of a bank statement because they know how easily faked it is. And yet this court has a lower standard of evidence than a mortgage company. And you can just use your imagination to see how this could be very, put us all in peril, that all it takes is basically a computer and maybe Photoshop 
if you want to get fancy, to create evidence. And that's the kind of evidence that was used. And other courts have thrown it out, but in this case, at the trial court level at least, it's setting a precedent that digital evidence is um, fine. And meanwhile, we'll probably get into the corrupt agents, but they had access to all that digital evidence and the ability to change anything they wanted. And then that same material was used in trial. So if, if that's a whole other question, we can, you know. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to need a lot of time. <laughs> but just to answer your first question, yeah. I know we've gone off on, is that what happened in the trial as far as the government was they had a very specific narrative. And they, and they wanted their trophy. They wanted their guy. And they, they prevented the defense from, from challenging this narrative. The narrative was, this is a, a kingpin thug who will do anything to protect his empire, and that's all he is. And the only thing on Silk Road was horrible, really hard drugs. They hardly mentioned even marijuana, which was the main product. And um, they did not allow Ross's libertarian beliefs to be mentioned to the jury. They didn't, um, uh, they, they didn't, they, the judge curtailed cross-examination of government witnesses where it was coming out that there was an alternate perpetrator. They blocked, the court blocked defense witnesses who could have challenged the government's testimony. And this is all in the appeal, which we're right in the middle of an appeal. Um, so the, all the jury really got to hear, and they didn't get to hear about these corrupt agents. That didn't, was not allowed to be mentioned at trial, even though the court knew about it, and so did the prosecution, until two months after trial. And so there, the fact that there were these corrupt agents who had unfettered access, keys to the kingdom of this entire site, and stole over a million dollars using their skills, and had the ability to do whatever they, pretty much anything they wanted, was not allowed to be mentioned to the jury. So. Well, let's take a couple of steps back. OK, um, yeah. the day the day you hear about this, uh, your son, Ross, gets arrested and you were in Costa Rica, correct? Mm -mm. No, I wasn't. No, um, that somebody said that on deep web. No, I, that, I, no, I was in Austin, Texas. Okay. My husband and I were in Austin, Texas. And the day after he was arrested, we got a call from Reuters <laughs> news service. Really? Telling us. That's how we found out. Mm hmm. And then suddenly I'm like, what? And suddenly uh, the neighborhood was all these journalists were knocking on our door, calling us, email. It was a barrage of we turn on the TV and I'm like, what? It, it was so shocking. It was so unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. It was so weird. And we hadn't heard from Ross yet. And um, finally he was able to call us, I think, the next day. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know what had happened to him. So um, anyway, yeah, it was pretty – talk about <laughs> – life-changing day yeah now when you when you Pretty finally long. did get a chance to talk to him had he already started to arrange for an attorney was he already starting uh had he been in contact with anybody else before you he had a criminal defense a uh, public defender okay assigned to him who was a, a great guy and i thought he did a really good job um very compassionate he's saying to me he said to me Ross is such a good soul. He's such a good person. He'd sit and visit with him. I mean, you know, he's kind of like, I don't get clients like this very often. And um, he's a really nice guy, very available. But once Ross was sent to New York City, um, you know, we needed, he was in California. This, and by the way, there is no good reason why Ross was being tried in the Southern District except the Southern District wanted the case. As far and Chuck Schumer was behind the case. Right. Um, I, I see no, I mean, they had this reason which was basically there was a heroin dealer addict who was testifying at Ross's trial in exchange for leniency. They had every incentive to lie, and in fact got caught in a couple of lies by the defense attorney and proven that he was lying, perjuring himself. And he said that he had bought uh, heroin on Silk Road and sold it in New York. And just the fact that he said that um, gave them the, what they needed to prosecute and have the trial in New York City. And... Um, he isn't from New York. He was arrested in California. Shouldn't have been in New York. He shouldn't be in New York. But uh, that's, the Southern District is very aggressive that way. Oh, boy. So. Yeah. Now, so. Yeah. And Chuck Schumer called for the whole takedown of Silk Road. And my personal theory, just to throw that in, is I, I, I don't think this is about drugs, and I can tell you why. 
The biggest drug dealer on Silk Road got 10 years. The biggest cocaine and heroin dealer on Silk Road got five years. The guy who was running Silk, the next iteration of Silk Road, eight years. But Ross gets double life. And I, they said, it's because you're the first to use the Internet in this way. We're going to make you an example. And in this way is Tor and using a cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. And Chuck Schumer is on the banking committee. It's like it seems to me so obvious. He also recommended the judge, Catherine Forrest, to her position. Mm-hmm. And Preet Bharar, the head uh, prosecutor of the Southern District and of this case, was his special counselor for many, many years. So I feel like it was a real setup politically. And um, Chuck Schumer even came out publicly and, uh, before trial and said, congratulations, you DOJ, you got your man. I'm like, hang on, don't we have a trial first? Hello? <laughs> Isn't it innocent until proven guilty? And um, apparently not for Chuck Schumer. No, he's never been a fan of, of individuals' of civil liberties. Uh, yeah. No, I don't, he's definitely not. <laughs> yeah, a very interesting yeah. guy. And I think he's running unopposed right now, too. Uh, uh, oh, is um, he really? That's, oh, that's so sad. Well, he's, he had his own corruption issues when he was first running for uh, office, though. So oh, yeah. I wrote about it, but whatever. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, doesn't touch that guy. So okay, anyway, so- but he... Um, yeah. Uh, initially, so Ross. Though, initially, Ross had a public defender. Then, when they moved him to New York, then, then he hired an attorney, a law firm. Yeah. Uh, well, yes. Uh, uh, Joshua Draytel, and he's been uh, his attorney since then. Was so. there ever a plea negotiation? No, because what they basically they said um, whatever the judge the plea was basically whatever the, there was no maximum. In other words, it was like. The 10 years or whatever the judge wants to give you. So there was no maximum. So it wasn't really a, a negotiation. You know, it wasn't like any guarantee. Most pleas are like, it'll be 10 years, you know, if you yeah. say this. And um, that was not offered. So you know, you know, they never had any offers? Well, he had that offer. It's, it's sort of, And they were very much urging him to do it. But uh, they, they were really pressuring to do it, even before the bail hearing. But it, the lawyer didn't advise him to take that. And what was the offer? He could have got 10 years? Or whatever. The, there was no limit. It was oh. like that was the minimum, and the maximum was, a, was life, which is what he ended up getting. But uh, they, they were, you know, Ross wanted to go to court because there was all, they knew about this corruption. They knew about all the questionable stuff. And they wanted a trial, you know. They wanted him to have a chance. So, so now, when that, you plea, that's it. You don't get to, you know, it's over. And if the judge goes, well, based on what I'm seeing here, it's, you know, in other words, there, it could, if it would, had been a, a, a feeling on it, that would be different. I'd never heard of a plea deal like that. I don't know if you have, but well, I've never heard of that. It, it, well, it, it's interesting. Well, it, in hindsight, you know, Considering the kind of probationary report he could have gotten with all these letters and stuff, like you said, and the Eagle Scout, all this stuff, no priors, right. you know, right. he could have, he could have got, you know, you know, but anyway, that's all hindsight. Now, he could have, well, she could have given him the mandatory minimum for the charges, and the, to me, the charges are questionable, of course. Right. But uh, that would have been twenty years. She could have done that for a thirty-two-year-old guy. Twenty years is a long. Time. And, it, you know, to me, it's like the, the Sentencing Reform Act says a sentence that's sufficient but no longer than necessary. She right. never gave a reason why it was necessary. She did get political about it and his political beliefs and use that as a part of it, justification. But it, we can talk about that. But she, he, um, he tell me that he's getting out in 20 years. Not, he's not allowed on the Internet or email or anything. And he's going to be a threat on the Internet to anyone. Who knows what, I mean, it'll be like Rip Van Winkle coming back out of sleeping for, you know, it's like it wasn't necessary to give him life. But she said she wanted to give him the um, worst possible sentence, which I assume if she could have given him the death penalty, she would have. She said the worst possible punishment because you're the first to use the Internet in this way and we're going to make an example of you. Yeah, really. And besides, she wasn't sure he had given up his political beliefs and... The site was philosophical, and she found it troubling and dangerous. Meanwhile, she's supposed to defend First Amendment rights. So that's another issue in the appeal. 
Uh, let, let's take a commercial break. We're with Lynn. Okay. <laughs> I'll break. The, you know. Could I? Can yeah. I take one for about ten years. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. Yeah, and I, I said before in, in the part because we had to restart the show when we were recording. Yeah. Lynn Albright could be any of our, our our mothers. She could be she could be my mother. You know, uh, this can happen yeah. uh, except for the age difference. You know, I'm probably older than you, but uh, the, the, the thing, I this, doubt it. <laughs> this, this can happen to any of us. Any of us could find us in this situation where you, you become the target of the federal government, and it's just overwhelming odds. And you, you're sitting in some cage someplace with a public defender, and That's then right. you're they're, they're pulling your case because some uh, senator, uh, senior senator from New York, yeah. is, is pulling strings behind it. And then, you know, we can get in on all this stuff, too, because then they try to Fourth Amendment defense. I which would is like pretty, to. Yeah, which is hopeless. You know, there's days. a book I, you may have heard of, Three Felonies a Day, which is basically saying we're all guilty of three felonies a day. There is no one knows the number of laws on the books now. They can. We're all in jeopardy because of this. That is it's so just, true. That is so true. Yeah. And there's a, a documentary, too, with this uh, Baltimore retired police officer who says, I can follow any car for three blocks and have a reason to pull them over. Because uh, no one can, mm-hmm. no one can, you know, to slow, too fast, you know, you know yeah. Yeah. we're in a police state and there's really no hope. Let's take a break to, with Lynn. Uh, Albright. <laughs> the website <laughs> is. On that happy note, let's, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Freeross.org. <laughs> also, too, there's coming up a, a free ross uh like a telethon all day long on December 9th. Uh, it's going to be eight hours long and you can find that at the freeross.org uh, website and also to the Free Ross uh, community page on uh, Facebook. So really Facebook, try and get, you yeah. know, send them a like, put a like on the Facebook page, get involved, keep updated on what's going on. Uh, the only hope we really have in these kind of cases is if we can uh, put attention on them. Otherwise, uh, you just have a guy, uh, there's so many guys that don't have a mother ready to come on the radio, uh, so sitting in these cages. Okay, let's take a commercial break. We'll be right back after this with more of Lynn Albrecht, the mother of Ross Albrecht from the Silk Road fame. And now a word from our sponsors. Did you know that 30% of all people on online dating websites and personal ads are either married or in a monogamous relationship? 30%. If you suspect that your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend may be cheating online, go to emailrevealer.com. Uh, on our online infidelity investigation. You give us their email address, and we could trace it back to online personal ads, dating sites, and social networks. We can even expand the investigation and find them uh, cheating on uh, escort service sites uh, or even porn sites if they're registered to porn sites and swinger sites. Uh, so check out emailrevealer.com if you suspect your spouse is cheating, and check out our online infidelity investigation. William Ramsey is a producer here at the Opperman Report, and he's just come out with a new book, Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Now, he just sent me a copy of this book. Oh, boy, it's about two inches thick. And there's a chapter on just about everybody in this book uh, that you could imagine, uh, the Beatles and... Uh, <laughs> uh, Jack Parsons... Uh, Everybody's in here. It's incredible. Uh, and I definitely recommend this book. There's a, a, a bunch of pictures in here, too, uh, of all these people in uh, different chapters and, and uh, information. Uh, Anton LaVey and people I've never heard of, too. There's a whole bunch in here. JC, JFC Fuller. I don't know who he is. Uh, but, but it's great stuff uh, by our, ho- our, our producer here, uh, William Ramsey. So check out Children of the Beast. Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com, or you could find it in the Opperman Report uh, dot com bookstore. We have an urgent bulletin. Uh, it seems that the group Strawman is still on the loose. It has been confirmed that Strawman are, are Canadian, okay, and that. Uh, Authorities are asking people to stay indoors, lock your doors and windows until this group can be dealt with. You could find more information about this group, this group of Canadians, at strawmanmusic.com.
you can have your ad played here. <laughs> okay, we're looking for sponsors. Okay, in fact, we desperately need sponsors right now to take this show to the next level. Uh, so you can have your advertise your ad uh, played here, read live, you know, like I'm doing now, so artfully. Or we can even uh, work up a little jingle for you with some music and stuff like that and play it here. You have no idea how inexpensive it would be uh, to have your ad played on the Opperman Report on seven stations uh, live Friday night and another seven stations live on Saturday night, uh, plus replayed every day of the week on different stations and then archived on YouTube, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and all different kinds of podcasts, uh, Pod This and Pod Bean, all different kinds of places uh, who archive the show for us. Uh, and, and on those archives, uh, your, your ad would play indefinitely, forever. Uh, you also get a little uh, banner on OppermanReport.com. Uh, you get a mention on the air. You get a little interview on the air and all kinds of fun stuff. If you sponsor Opperman Report, we have an opportunity to get this show on a major AMFM station in California, we've been approved. Uh, so, if you want to sponsor us into that, uh, so incredibly inexpensive that that your ad would be heard uh, by a uh, the, the the range covers five million people in population, uh, where your ad would be broadcast, and all these other uh, stations would be thrown in for free. Uh, so, really uh, affordable prices to sponsor OppermanReport.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. You can get a copy of that book at emailrevealer.com, or you can get a copy of that book now. It's back up on Amazon.com, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator by Ed Opperman. And this book has been updated a little bit from the previous book that we had uh, that was available to our wonderful listeners. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, we're here with uh, Lynn Ulbricht, the mother of Ross Ulbricht, who's uh, serving a life sentence right now uh, for the convictions related to Silk Road. Uh, you can find out more information at freeross.org, and also uh, there's a free Rossathon coming up on December 9th. And you can also check out Facebook at the Free Ross uh, community page. Uh, so, Lynn, you there? That's December 4th, by the way. December 4th? Sunday, December 4th. So yeah. my four looks like a nine. I gotta fix that. <laughs> December <laughs> four. <laughs> now let me ask you a question. Now, now they grab him. Uh, he, he was never able to get bail. Well, we tried for bail, and in fact, um, different individuals, uh, family and friends, pledged over pledged a million dollars. They put up their homes. They put up their life savings uh, because they know Ross and they trust him and they have faith in him and they knew that he wouldn't run and leave them holding the bag. And um, there were 70 some odd letters, more than our attorney had ever seen in his 30 years of practice for a bail hearing. And, but what happened was at the last minute, trial by ambush, which is what apparently the government does quite a bit, according to our attorney, they dropped these um, murder for hire allegations out there and said that Ross had planned murder for hire. And they, these have, then, when it came time to uh, charge him, they didn't charge him with it, and it was never a charge at trial. So they, it was used to deprive him of bail because normally you're supposed to get bail unless you're dangerous, and they claimed Ross was dangerous, which anyone who knows Ross realizes how absurd this is. And um, But that's what happened, and then they went on to use the same uncharged crimes to uh, – prejudice the jury. They, the judge allowed them to discuss it. They went, oh, well, he's not charged with this, but blah, blah, blah. And so the jury's listening to this whole thing. And then um, also the sentencing, the judge relied on it. And um, then, uh, so it's being appealed. Um, and people like uh, LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and a former federal judge, Nancy Gertner, Drug Policy USA and um, Just Leadership USA have all written letters as part of the appeal saying this sentence, part of what they're saying is this should not be relied on with uncharged, unproven allegations. That should not be a factor in a sentencing. It should be what's been proven in trial, supposedly proven, in trial and convicted, not, you know, basically hearsay based on digital evidence. No. So. 
He didn't get bail. That was correct. <laughs> you, didn't get, you didn't get bail. Now, there was also some issues, too, uh, with, uh, and, and again, what happens so often in these trials with the prosecution uh, withholding discovery and then dumping thousands of pages <laughs> on your lap the day before trial or a week before trial. Uh, or even sometimes in the middle in the middle of the trial, you know. You know, but I, I believe this trial was only a couple, of, yeah, a couple of days. This trial only lasted a couple of days, right? It lasted three weeks. Oh, three weeks. Okay, really. Okay. Uh, so now, so give us an idea. Now, what was some of the uh, evidence that was dumped out like a week before that, that the defense was not able to to review? Well, it's, it was the thirty five hundred material. There was the discovery material that was. Um, I think six terabytes worth, huge amount, that um, there were many delays and obstructions to being able to go through that. They did manage to go through some, and Ross is continuing to go through it now post-trial. But um, because who can, it's like several libraries of Congress, I think, is the amount of material. But in any case, seven to ten days um, ahead of trial, there was, I think it was uh, 7,500 pages worth of stuff, I mean, a week before trial, basically. And um, they did go through it, and they did find evidence of an alternate perpetrator in the government's own evidence, and the government's own witness testified to this. And then it got the judge um, basically said, yeah, that's all relevant, and it's all good on the third day. And by the fourth day, which was after a long weekend, she came back and said, no, wait, I changed my mind. It's all irrelevant. Strike it from the record. Jury, forget you ever heard about this alternate perpetrator. And um, you can never mention it. And she basically put a leash on the defense from then on. And I have a little recap, a three-minute recap on the homepage of freeroth.org uh, showing, uh, you know, the, 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 the contrast between day three and day four because suddenly everything was off limits to explore in this realm. And that's part of the appeal. Because it turns out, of course, that that was one um, track. But the other is there were two corrupt agents who the defense was not allowed to talk about, mention, have anything to do with, at, and the jury was kept from knowing about. And that is suppressed evidence. That's in violation of the Brady Rule, which says you can't hide evidence that's exculpatory that's favorable to a defendant. That's against the law. And so that's a big part of Ross's appeal. It's like, hey, maybe the, maybe the jury had been given all the evidence, there would have been reasonable doubt not to convict him. Now, well, this, this story of these two corrupt agents is probably, to me, is the most fascinating thing in this whole story. Yeah, it uh, is. You know, the, the most it's tragic. It's not talked about yeah. enough, nearly enough um, by the mainstream media. Right. And you'd think. You know, this is the most. Yeah. Uh, uh, Do it, not, yeah. Yeah, really. it's the most interesting yeah. part. Yeah, you know, forget. I mean, we can't forget. But but putting aside the tragic, uh, you know, loss of the son here, yeah. you know, sitting in jail. But but this case yeah. where that uh, I, I believe it, this DEA agent was also one of the leadership. He, he had assumed the leadership yeah. role. And so it, describe what happened here. Yeah, he. This you're talking about the DEA agent is Carl Mark Force, who was at the core of the Maryland investigation in Silk Road. He he was the one of the main people. The other agent, who the defense didn't even know about at trial, they were told about Force pre-trial and told he couldn't talk about it. They weren't even informed of the second agent, Sean Bridges, until after trial. Sean Bridges was working for the NSA at the time he was investigating Silk Road, which so presumably had all of their tools, but also. Um, he was a former. He was Secret Service at the time. He oh, was really? doing both, and they used their. They're both computer experts. Sean Bridges is a dark net expert. He is. He's a record of framing people, and um, Carl Force was also very adept at computers, and they had the ability and the skill, to and the access to do anything they wanted on the site, and they used it to steal over a million dollars, but in Bitcoin, uh, but also. The government perhaps doesn't even know the extent of their corruption. There's still a big question, and this is really interesting, the, um, of, that we just know the tip of the iceberg, basically, is what our lawyer said about the corruption. I'm personally pretty sure there were there are more agents, corrupt agents. The, the guy who helped, the work for Bitstamp, who helped um, expose Carl Force, one of the agents, he says just said recently in public, 
yeah, I think there's more people out there. There's a lot of unaccounted for money. And um, there's all kinds of sealed and undisclosed evidence with these agents. They had encrypted emails that were not decrypted. They're in jail, and the emails remained encrypted. So the government doesn't seem very interested in getting to the bottom of this. <laughs> for whatever reason, I mean, I personally think they're hiding something, but um, for whatever reason, they don't, they're don't. they not acting very keen on exposing this, unsealing it, getting to the bottom of it, uh, and even talking about how the corruption could be a factor in the trial. Um, so they don't really have, they don't seem to have an interest. They, they seem more interested in having their trophy, having their head on the spike of the, you know, medieval castle kind of thing, you know, to warn others and have their victory and not really look into a lot of questions in this case and a lot of uh, players who are very questionable people. And it's still unknown the extent of the corruption. We don't know. And the defense is kept from knowing and it's, it's, continues so now these two were they convicted yes they've been convicted they actually had uh, confessed okay and they're in prison and, one and, got seven years one got six years now it's interesting because now here you got a dea agent and it's notorious that you know dea they, they do a bust you know things you know there's, there's shrinkage you might call it with yeah. the, with the money. Yeah. you know this is notorious <laughs> okay you know, a boy guy gets on the stage, what are you talking about? I had eight pounds. I didn't have seven pounds. What are you talking about? <laughs> you, know? uh, you hear this all the time. Okay. And sometimes it's on tape, too. You know, it's just fascinating. But, you know, th this happens. This shrinkage. Things get lost, you know, mm. off the truck. But now, so, but somehow a million bucks wound up in a personal checking account of one of these cops. Well, Bitcoin account. Bitcoin account. Yeah. Oh, no, are you sure? Because I had read in an article that it, that it wound up in a personal checking account, ultimately. From the agents? Yeah. The agents had a personal checking account? Yeah. Well, I, I thought that they, well, that may be possible. I could be wrong. Yeah. <coughs> they ended up with money. Yeah, we're going to have to go back One and look at that because you, you, you got to think these guys would know a better way to launder this money than, than wind up in their personal checking. Yeah, yeah. I think it was in Bitcoin because okay. Bitstamp, who I referred to before, where he, the guy who kind of exposed force and got wind of his activity, that was Bitcoin. Um, I think a lot of it if not all of it was Bitcoin, but I, I like I said, I'm not positive. Then, then let me ask you this: if, if, if these right. if these two cops were able to siphon off a million dollars, uh, did did Ross have a, a big account someplace in Switzerland or something like that with a lot of money where he could pay for a big defense and and uh, all this kind Wouldn't of stuff? Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. <laughs> no, um, he had money. He had Bitcoin on his laptop. But the thing about that is. Ross was into Bitcoin years and years ago when it was worth very little, like pennies, dime, mm -hmm. 15 cents. And he was totally into getting Bitcoin. And then, of course, it went to $1,000. I asked him back then, I said, Ross, should I get some? And he goes, Mom, no, it's too volatile. And I'm like, gee, I wish I hadn't taken that advice. But in any case, um, there's no proof of where Ross got that, that Bitcoin. But they were on his laptop and they've been seized. Um, but in any case, no, he, there is no hidden wallet, a uh, stash of money somewhere. There is money missing that they haven't accounted for, but, um, no, it's not, Ross doesn't have it. Now, when Ross, Ross was arrested, was he living in a big mansion someplace in, uh, uh, Beverly Hills? Yeah, he was, um, wearing the shoes that I bought him for his birthday two years ago. He didn't have a car, own a car. He was sharing a flat in San Francisco with three, uh, three other roommates. And one of whom uh, came to trial and testified on his behalf. Um, no, he was very simple lifestyle. <laughs> totally. I mean, uh, yeah. And people look at me. I'm like, yeah, here I am, mother of kingpin. Do I look like a mother of a kingpin? I have no bling. Believe me. Yeah. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, you know, uh, well, I'm even less like a kingpin than I used to be. Not that I was, but, um, you know, it costs so much money to have a defense. It's, we're living in a very tiny little, extremely simple place, and, you know, so we can afford to do this. I mean, it's, everything goes to defending him. It's, uh, and as you, I'm sure, know, it's ruinous, and I think it's yeah. one way that the government does uh, crush people is it costs so much money. And what, what the goal of this Rothathon is a, actually a $14,000 goal to pay for, not to a lawyer, but to a printer, who had to compile, 
who we had to hire to compile the appeals, the appellate briefs in, in bound copies and, and make a digital copy for the court. It was over $13,000 just for that. Well, plus another, yeah, it was close to fourteen. And this is what it cost people to pursue justice. And we were told, well, if you can't do it yourself, because if you mess it up, they could throw the case out and you don't dare, you know, and uh, it's crazy. And there's a whole sub industry that's serving this whole machinery that's requiring all of this. It's just, and then we can get into the whole criminal justice system and the prison industrial complex and all that and how much money is being made and how they're protecting that money with laws and all kinds of things and how many nonviolent people are, and yeah. their children's lives are being destroyed. Now we've done a hundred shows on that. Yeah, we get calls. From, yeah, we have callers calling from prison. We, you know, we, we we've done a shows. Oh, on that. really? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, I could tell you a story. My my friend Reverend Pinkney, forget it. He's, he's in prison right now. Ten years uh, for uh, they claiming he forged some signatures on a recall petition. They gave him the guy's sixty seven years old. Oh come on! Uh, oh come on! <laughs> this, we, oh, this, God. Yeah, I know it's horrific. Our country. It's like I'm like what? This is so un American. And I, I, it's like. We have we have more of our citizens in the cages yeah, in any than country. any country in history of the world or any country existing now. Yeah. And that's like, really? This is the United States? What's going on? You know, it's um it's very, very bad. But now, and like you say, you don't realize it till you really see it. You know, you kinda of forget about it. Because yeah. it's you know, these guys in jail and Oh, oh, you, oh people will I, say, Oh, the there they, I see the a, families. In, I know them. There's mm-hmm. people right now will say he's in club fed. Oh, three hots in a cot. He's on a tennis court. Right, you know, right, oh, right. Yeah, but, uh-huh. yeah, oh, that right. was a white collar crime. Give me a break. He's he's doing. You know, they're nuts, man. But no, but back to these no, two these two cops. Back to these two cops. Okay, because okay. now they yeah, they yeah, yeah. now one of these they ran they rose up in the ranks of this uh, Silk Road to be administrators of Silk Road. Am I, am I I'm co- not sure how it inspired. They may have been appointed right out of the gate. I don't know. Okay. They're, they ran, they were on it for two years. I know Carl Force was. He was for two years core investigator. Mm-hmm. And he has a, a background too. He was doing these things where he would uh, send people, email someone a photograph of his badge as if to use that as a subpoena to get people to turn over records to him. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'm yeah. telling you, when I read these articles, I haven't read them recently, but when I did, the, the, the behavior of these two characters here is so beyond uh, anything. Yeah, it is. Now, And there's been several cases thrown out that Sean Bridges was involved in just because he was involved with them and he's so corrupt. And like I said before, I, I don't think they're the only ones. I don't. I mean, I don't have proof of that, but... I, I think there's a lot more to the story. Otherwise, I don't think things would be kept so secret and all this money unaccounted for. I think there's there's more to it. Now, now Sean Bridges um, was a. You said he worked for the NSA, right? The National Security he Agency. He was working for the NSA at the time he was investigating Silk Road. Okay. Concurrently. Well, and and the right and NSA is not even supposed to be involved in, in investigations of U.S. No. citizens, right, or prosecutions whatsoever. Absolutely not. Okay. Well, he was also Secret Service, so I guess that was the I don't know. Well, sure. You know, you take your hat Maybe. off. You know, you take the one badge off. You put it in the drawer. <laughs> you put the other badge on, and everything's legal. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Now, now the thing is, though, is that uh, there's a Fourth Amendment. And, and by the way, real quick, yeah. the NSA, Snowden, Edward Snowden, addressing this case, oh, brought really? this case said that it's unthinkable the NSA wasn't involved. And yet when the, the defense brought it up in a motion, the government's response was not, oh, no, they're not involved. Their response was mocking. They go, oh, the boogeyman, oh, you're going to bring up the NSA. But they never said no. They never said they're not involved. Hmm. And it's well known that the NSA feeds the DEA information they acquired illegally, and then they give it to law enforcement, and they make up a story, parallel construction about, oh, this is what happened. This is how we got this. And it's not true. And this is, it's covering up the illegal activity of the NSA. This is another thing that really should alarm people, that we have this basically rogue agency working against its own citizens, from what I have learned. 
I understand. And and specifically in this case, there's a Fourth Amendment issue too, because the, there is no oh, yeah. documentation. Is. Well, explain what the Fourth Amendment issue is. Well, the issue in the appeal is that um, the warrants that were used to seize Ross's laptop, Facebook, and Gmail accounts were called general warrants, which is the kind of warrant we fought the Revolutionary War for, because it was to pre prevent, it's to pre and, it, and why they wrote the Fourth Amendment, is to prevent the government invading your home and rummaging from attic to basement for anything they can find, basically going on a fishing expedition. In this case, they raided was a digital home and went searching whoever they could find. And it's a general warrant, an Electronic Freedom Foundation, EFF, and National Association for Criminal Defense Lawyers have both signed on to the appeal saying, yeah, this is unconstitutional. And the government's response is, well, no, it doesn't count because it's digital. This is digital material, so it's not papers. Now, if it had been a physical file cabinet that they seized, there'd be no question this is unconstitutional. You have to go and get a folder and have a warrant for that folder. But they're saying a laptop isn't, doesn't count because it's digital. And meanwhile, it's like a, a file coming on steroids. It's a gateway to all kinds of personal information. It's w more than a file cabinet. So this is a huge question for the digital age and our privacy rights in the digital age. And it's being, it's, this isn't the only case where they're arguing it, but it's one of them. Yeah, and unfortunately, the Fourth Amendment even to find an attorney that's going to raise a Fourth Amendment defense these days, because it's so hopeless. Uh, which, which, well, you know what the excuse the, the court, uh, the prosecution gave? They go, well, even if the warrants were illegal, yeah. the, the the investigators operated in good faith, and this in good faith argument is being upheld in some cases. And I'm like, wait a second here. So if I do something in good faith and it turns out to be illegal, it's okay. You know. Yeah, it's horrific. There, there, there really is no Fourth Amendment anymore. And, and they just had another ruling just oh. recently where uh, you can get pulled over to the side of the road, dragged out of your car, your car searched. Uh, if they find nothing, fine, you go on your way. But if they find something and then they find out that you have a warrant, all of that evidence used without a warrant, used without a probable cause, all that evidence can be used against you in court because you have a warrant. Uh, so it's just unbelievable. Let's take another little quick commercial uh -huh. break, okay? And um, okay. can you give me about another half hour, you think? Um, sure. Um, what time? Uh, yeah, I'm sure I can. Okay, I great, great. We'll take no a look problem. with Lynn Albrecht. Yeah. Uh, she's the mother of Ross Albrecht, who got mixed up in this Silk Road prosecution. Uh, you could find out more about this case at freeross.org. And don't forget, you know, there's a Free Ross community page on Facebook. And there's a big thing coming up December 4th, okay? If you, if you tuned out earlier and you thought it was December 9th, you missed it, okay? But it's December 4th, the Free Rossathon. It's going to be eight hours long, a whole bunch of people speaking, and they're going to be raising funds. I'm sure there's a donate button, too, at uh, freeross.org. Uh, so we'll be right back after these messages with more of Lynn Ulbrich. And now a word from our sponsors. Did you know that 30% of all people on online dating websites and personal ads are either married or in a monogamous relationship 30 percent if you suspect that your husband your wife your boyfriend your girlfriend may be cheating online go to email revealer.com uh at our online infidelity investigation you give us their email address and we can trace it back to online personal ads dating sites and social networks we can even expand the investigation and find them uh, cheating on uh, escort service sites uh, or even porn sites if they're registered to porn sites and swinger sites. Uh, so check out emailrevealer.com if you suspect your spouse is cheating and check out our online infidelity investigation. William Ramsey is a producer here at the Opperman Report and he's just come out with a new book. Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Now, he just sent me a copy of this book. Oh, boy, it's about two inches thick. And there's a chapter on just about everybody in this book uh, that you can imagine. Uh, the Beatles. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Jack Parsons. Uh, everybody's in here. It's incredible. Uh, and I definitely recommend this book. There's a, a, a bunch of pictures in here, too, uh, of all these people in uh, different chapters and, and uh, information. Uh, Anton LaVey and 
people I've never heard of, too. There's a whole bunch in here. JC, JFC Fuller. I don't know who he is. Uh, but, but it's great stuff uh, by our, ho- our, our producer here, uh, William Ramsey. So check out Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com. Or you could find it in the Opperman Report uh, dot com bookstore. We have an urgent bulletin. Uh, it seems that the group Straw Man is still on the loose. It has been confirmed that Straw Man are, are Canadian, okay, and that uh, authorities are asking people to stay indoors. Lock your doors and windows until this group can be dealt with. You could find more information about this group, this group of Canadians, at strawmanmusic.com. You can have your ad played here. (laughs) We're looking for sponsors. Okay, In fact, we desperately need sponsors right now to take this show to the next level. Uh, So you can... Have your advertise your ad uh, played here, read live, you know, like I'm doing now, so artfully, or we can even uh, work up a little jingle for you with some music and stuff like that and play it here. You have no idea how inexpensive it would be uh, to have your ad played on the Opperman Report on seven stations uh, live Friday night and another seven stations live on Saturday night, uh, plus replayed every day of the week on different stations and then archived on YouTube. Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and all different kinds of podcasts, uh, Pod This and Pod Bean, all different kinds of places uh, who archive the show for us. Uh, and, and on those archives, uh, your, your ad would play indefinitely, forever. Uh, you also get a little uh, banner on OppermanReport.com. Uh, you get a mention on the air. You get a little interview on the air and all kinds of fun stuff if you sponsor Opperman Report. We have an opportunity to get this show on a major AMFM station in California. We've been approved. Uh, so if you want to sponsor us into that, uh, so incredibly inexpensive that, that your ad would be heard uh, by a uh, – the, 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 the range covers 5 million people in population uh, where your ad would be broadcast and all these other uh, stations would be thrown in for free. Uh, so really uh, affordable prices to sponsor OppermanReport.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. You can get a copy of that book at EmailRevealer.com, or you can get a copy of that book now. It's back up on Amazon.com, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator by Ed Opperman. And this book has been updated a little bit from the previous book that we had uh, that was available to our wonderful listeners. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman. Uh, we're here today with uh, Lynn Ulbricht, who's the mother of uh, Ross Ulbricht uh, from the Silk Road fame. You can find out more about this story at freeross.org. You can also donate money at freeross.org. December 4th, there's a free Ross a uh, coming up with a whole bunch of speakers and guests. It can be uh, eight hours long. Uh, so, Lynn, you there? Yeah, I am. Okay, great. I always get nervous now because <laughs> we had that problem. In the <laughs> I know. <laughs> now, now, what did you think about the film Deep Web? Were you happy with the the way things were laid out there in that film? I think that it was. I had some quibbles, and I, um, you know, it's not an advocacy piece per se. However, I think that it definitely was brought up a lot of questions. I think for the most part, it was fair. And um, it certainly has opened a lot of people's minds and um, brought us a lot of support. And I will say that I believe that Alex Winter, the director, has a lot of integrity. And he is not doing this for sensationalism or anything like that. He really cares about making a good documentary and pursuing an objective point of view. Um, So overall, my answer is yes, I am happy with it. Is there any major issues you want to... Like I say, quibbles, but... Yeah. Anything you want to correct? Anything you want to correct about the film? Because I'm sure people are going to be they're going to search for this and they're going to find that. You know. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, really, it's just like uh, Ross. Like for instance, as you brought up, Ross's personal friend on there said, "Oh, he, um, we were in Costa Rica. Well, we weren't." And then okay. he said, "Oh, Ross wanted to join a fraternity." And I'm like, I even asked Ross about that. He goes, "No, I, ne- I never wanted to join a fraternity," <laughs> you know, and things like that. That um, 
you know, just little things like that. And um, nothing major that really changes. It, I felt like it showed enough of Ross and who he really is through video and that sort of thing that um, it really gave you a sense of him and his sweet character and harmless character. And, um, you know, saw us going through the whole trial and gave a sense about the drug war. I mean, I think it was very comprehensive. Um, so, in general, I would say, um, you know, overall it was good. There were some things taken out that I wish had been left in, like an anecdote uh, from this same friend who said that um, Ross, the friend, killed a bee or trapped a bee and put it in the freezer to kill it. And Ross ran over to the freezer to free it because he thought it was cruel. And I really had wished it had stayed because it shows, you know, he's being accused of being a murderous kingpin, literally called murderous, and yet he was running over to save a bee. And um, he's just very compassionate. And so, uh, anyway, you know, this is a mother's point of view. I'm going, oh, uh, you know, I put know. that part in. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, I, I say overall it was good, and it's really a good movie. It's very riveting. It's not boring at all. It's very... Um, captivating, and they did. They did include a, a scene of Ross in a tutu singing "I'm a Little Teapot." Yeah. <laughs> He's you... very embarrassed about that, by the way. He goes, "Yeah, I know that probably," and I'm like, "Yeah, but you know, it shows his playful side." Well, when you're hanging out in prison with the other kingpins, you know, you don't want that stuff coming up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want those kingpins in uh, yeah. tutus. Uh, you don't find too many kingpins in tutus. I don't think. Now, I, I don't know any kingpins, but right. personally, but. Anyway, uh, yeah, no, uh, but, you know, he's very playful. He's a lot of fun. He's very easygoing and got a great sense of humor. And, that, you know, that's him, you know. And so I thought that was, I liked it, that it was there. That was cute. Now, now, the other Fourth Amendment issue is the search of the Silk Road servers, which I believe were overseas, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Um, well, I think there might have been a server in Pennsylvania and a server in Iceland and, um, I'm not the best person about the technical part. I can tell you that the um, ex-FBI agent, Christopher Tarbell, who, by the way, was key to the investigation, served the criminal complaint, was the head of the arrest team, said how he found the server, claimed how he found the server, it was never at trial. He was kept from trial. The government did not bring him to testify or be cross-examined which he was a key person in it. But in any case, um, his explanation of how he found the server was, um, well, basically mocked worldwide as absurd, uh, impossible, a lie by experts all over the, uh, the planet. And uh, our own defense submitted an affidavit spelling out why what he said didn't add up and asking for an evidentiary hearing, which was denied. So basically, if it's, and then he goes, well, I'd prove it, but I didn't save my work. I'm like, what? The dog ate my evidence. You know, it's like, you don't save your work on the biggest, and you have to click don't save in, in this particular program to not save your work. And surely the FBI has backup systems. But in any case, he claimed he didn't save his work, so he couldn't prove how he, he did it. You, you just have to trust him. And so, you know, this has been, you know, no one believes this. And um, yet he, under oath, he gave this explanation and got away with it so far. Right, because all this evidence from the server logs was presented in yeah. court with really no explanation yeah. of how they got it. Well, they have an explanation. It's just been called, uh, it, it says there's no connection to the actual p truth or mm -hmm. how it could possibly have happened. And these are people, I, don't ask me to explain it because I'm, I, you know, these are people who are technical mm -hmm. experts, but uh, it was you know, uh, mocked and, um, you know, discredited worldwide. And they explained how, and it's in Deep Web as well, if you saw the movie you saw. Um, uh, oh, gosh, I'm going to blank on his name. But he's very well-respected computer expert from Stanford saying, this has no relation to the truth at all. This is ridiculous. And meanwhile, we have, we have another actor in all this who's uh, uh, Sean Bridges, who's NSA, uh, who's in prison yeah. now in jail <laughs> doing six years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, exactly. it's, it's, you think a casual observer would, 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 would or look, overlook this <laughs> and say, hey, gee whiz, yeah, maybe this happened. What do you think? You know, but no. Yeah. Is there reasonable doubt here? Yeah. And and yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing, really. And it just keeps being 
more bizarre all the time. You know, it just keeps being bizarre. And um, so. What's the next date for and, the and appeal? I, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. The, no, no, no. I'm done. The, ne- the next date for the appeal, what's what's coming up next? Well, we just had oral arguments, which is when the three appellate judges hear, you know, get to, for 10 minutes aside. I mean, it's very fast. Question the prosecution. Question um, the defense. And um, then now it's it's really up to the judges in their timetable. They have everything in writing and they have the oral arguments. So now it's a matter of when on their schedule they have time to write it up and make their decision and write it up and submit it. So um, that's the next thing we're waiting for. It's a nail biter. And and what are it's the na- what are the major errors that, that you're trying to point out in the appeal? Well, the corruption, the preclusion of the corruption evidence is a big part of it. Because it's saying we weren't allowed to pursue this. We weren't allowed to talk about it. This is wrong. This is not fair in a trial to not be able to present all the evidence. That's just very basic. Um, The general warrants plus pen traps, which were misused without a warrant, uh, the Fourth Amendment issues, that covers the Fourth Amendment issues, where they used pen trap trap and trace registers to track him, and that is illegal. Uh, And, you know, you can see that that's, concerning because the government can use these things to track you down and they're not supposed to be there's no law for that and then the other major part of it and there's all these details within it it's a very long appeal it's 170 pages so it's really longer than most appeals uh is the sentence because the sentence is so out of line with what's proportional or fair or uh really legal and it relied on besides the murder for hire besides um uh, other things that were not at trial were not proven. It also relied on Ross's political beliefs and Silk Road's political philosophy. And um, it's a real First Amendment issue because if a, if a life sentence can be bolstered by an attack on someone's political views, you, well, you know, it's, it's very concerning, obviously. Okay. Those are sacro things. Yeah, yeah. that seems the the... the the corruption in these cops, that's huge. And the pen traps, I wasn't even aware of. Okay, this is, okay. Yeah. yeah, you got a good case, okay. That's under the, in the appeal, too, yeah. And it's, the appeal itself is on, you can link to from our website under documents. There's a, there's a page called The Case, and it has it's such an unwieldy, giant thing. And it's broken down into parts. And one part says documents. You go on there and you can read the actual appeal if you want to. Um, and other um, defense um, briefs. Now, about a so. year ago, I guess you had a heart attack? I did what I had. I have a very healthy heart, and I don't have heart disease. What happened was uh, it's called broken heart syndrome, oh and it's uh, actually, I didn't even know this existed, but uh, it did almost kill me. I, be, I actually literally came into the emergency room with no heartbeat and was saved by my brother-in-law doing CPR, my sister, um, I uh, and then the nurses and air flight. And all. But it's, um, it's from stress and grief, and it um, apparently – your body makes this hormone that attacks your heart when you're really under this. And have, frankly, going through that trial and sentencing, I think uh, I started having symptoms and it just went downhill. And yeah, I ended up in the hospital. But um, here I am <laughs> to fight another day. You know, it's like, uh, but it takes its toll. This takes its toll on your family. It takes its toll on your, you individually and not to mention financially and, you know, so many ways. I am very, I do feel very privileged to be able to speak out about some of these violations because Ross is not the only one, as you well know. Yeah. He's not unique. And um, I go to the prison regularly, and I know these families and these children. And no one's, who's going to speak for them? I mean, I, I feel like I'm doing that for them, too, because it's just um, what's going on is wrong. And... Um, a judge, judge Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit said there's an epidemic of prosecutorial violations in this country, and they're not getting uh, any consequences. I guess in California they've passed a bill now that they will have some consequences, but, I mean, it's, it's really, really wrong that they can ruin people's lives and withhold evidence and all kinds of things uh, without any repercussions. And, in fact, they get promoted. Yeah. It's just amazing <laughs> the, the amount of energy and resources that we spend fighting government oppression that if all this True. could be unleashed, you know, for good, you know, for good works. That's a really good point. It's just that amazing. That's such a good point. It's, it's overwhelming. Mm-hmm. 
But we got to keep it fighting. Is. We got to resist. We got to keep fighting. We can't stop. But you got to. What are you going to yeah, do? Yeah. Just lay over and let them take our country and our freedom? It's only going to get worse. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you got to. I mean, at least I think I'll go down fighting, you know? Yeah. It's like, um, it's, it's, you know, I hate to see our, our country and our constitution hijacked. And that's what I feel like I'm seeing. This is my personal belief. I mean, I don't want to, you know, but it's like, yeah. And anyway, it's, it's very, uh, I think, I feel like we're at a tipping point in history. I really do. And I feel like it can go either way. And I'm very, very concerned about it. Uh, when's the last I time? I hope we're at the point. I hope I, we haven't gone over the edge yet. I, yeah. I, what's uh, when's the last time you talked to Ross? Oh, I just talked to him uh, yesterday. Okay. Yeah, he I, calls pretty frequently. Um, oh no, sorry, the day before. But his dad visited him yesterday. Uh, I'll visit him next week. Um, you know, we sometimes take turns, or I'll go. So it's you know. Or I always make sure he has a visit. I think it's so important for these guys to at least have some interaction and, and connection with the outside world. And a lot of them don't have that, which is a whole other heartbreaking story. But um, I make sure Ross does. Now, is he? Yeah, I've, tried to help, I've tried to help other inmates get visitors, but it's, it's been very difficult. I haven't been able to pull it off. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved. Yeah, and that's a whole trip in itself, too. But yeah. And, now, is yeah. he able to have one of those Amazon wish lists where people can send him books and stuff? We do. We have an Amazon wish list, um, and I don't know if there's much on it right now, but um, yeah. How would you they find that? They can do that. They can. It's it's on our donation page. Okay. And uh, there's also the commissary if they want to give to that instead of if they don't want to give the defense fund. There's if you buy through uh, Amazon, you can um, you know help us out there. It doesn't cost anything. There's a game based on our, uh, Ross's art they did in prison that we've made that. Um, it's very cheap, a dollar to play, basically, and uh, that's a, a fun way to give. There's the Rossathon. We're always coming up with something, right, um, trying to uh, raise money because uh, lawyers, our lawyers are very patient <laughs> and very dedicated, but it, it, it's very expensive. As you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's true. Even the lawyers and investigators and any expert witnesses will be so patient, you know, oh. and you'll do work for free. Yeah, they are. But it's, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's, a life, it's like a mortgage. It's a lifetime bill for the rest of your life. You, you destroy a family uh, trying to get their, their, right. their kid out of trouble. It's just uh, heartbreaking. Now, is there anything I've forgotten to ask you that you think it's important that you want the audience to know? Well, just that the precedents that are being set here. I think that because people, I, I want people to realize this isn't just about my son or a website or, and please don't get distracted by all the sensationalism around the case because it's really precedent is being set. And these high profile cases, traditionally the government uses them to make bad law and it filters down and then it's just the way it is. So we have the use of digital evidence in a trial. We have transferred intent, making somebody responsible for what other people do. We have um, the Fourth Amendment violation, First Amendment violations. I mean, there's a lot. It's this appeal, God forbid. I'm I'm praying and hoping that it'll be, you know, reversed. That it's, you know, it will be push a good pushback and it will be um, changed. But if precedent is set, this means going forward, other people's trials uh, will have that energy behind them that, you know, takes away our rights some more. And I'm probably not even remembering all the precedents. There's so many. Um, so th these trials are important and these cases are important. It's not just about a guy or, you know, because, look, people don't know my son. They don't know him. I mean, what? But really, there's b much bigger issues here at stake. And that's really what I've been concentrating on and trying to have people understand that it, it affects us all. Okay, and, and one last thing, because I know a lot of people are going to comment, and they're going to say, oh, Ed, you know, the deep web, the dark web, it's all child pornography over there. Was there any evidence, any kind well, of child pornography on Silk Web? Absolutely not. That's what I was saying in the beginning. Was, right. In fact, they had some debate, because it, I, I know they, whoever it was, there was a forum, and I was able to read it after the fact. Well, well, hey, if this is a free market, we should be able to have child pornography, and the administration of Silk Road just said, no, we're not having it, and you can go somewhere else. There was no child pornography and um, at all, and um, so that I, that needs to be clear. And there was and people go, oh, there were assassinations. No, there weren't. You know, it, it's amazing what the um, media will say. You know, it's you know, you know that, right? Yeah. Um, 
So anyway, um, yeah, no, there was none of that. Look, I'm not, like I say, I'm not defending Silk Road. I'm certainly not advocating drug use or any of that. I'm not. And, you know, there were unsavory things on Silk Road. There were unsavory things on the Internet. Child porn wasn't one of them on Silk Road. But um, that, and I get that, and we can argue about that and, or not argue or agree, but that's not really what's important here, really. It's this precedent that's being set because it applies. Like I was saying, FedEx gets a criminal indictment under the same philosophy, the same theory, legal theory as Book Road, the same, transferred intent. FedEx is responsible for its customers, what they do. And, you know, that's a slippery slope. <laughs> and and, and so, one other thing, too, is that even after they took down Silk Road, like 20 other sites popped up like the next day, right? It's not like this put an end oh, to Oh, and yeah. they're bigger, they're bigger, and they're, they don't have the same restrictions, the same philosophy. I mean, Silk Road had a book club, and it had um, – you know, various doctor on uh, to advise people and all kinds of things. It was more like a little political community. I'm not making it like it was nothing, but it, it did have those aspects. These don't. This is pure out whatever, you know, commerce. And the joke of it is, the bad joke, is that he was given the sentence to stop other people from doing it. Well, no, it's had the exact opposite effect. The, there has been no deterrence. It's been, you know, in fact, a proliferation of these sites. So that the life sentence didn't work in that regard. Right. And every one of these sites, these other sites now that popped up, they can all have DEA agents working there and NSA agents working there, uh, siphoning off money and, and uh, taking their little cut and doing whatever they're doing too as well. Uh, I assume so. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. That could be a whole, I don't know. That's an interesting point. I'll have to think about that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> Uh, Lynn, you know more about these things than I do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Lynn, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ed. Thank you so much. It's been fun. It has been. Thank you so much. Anything new comes You're up? Fun to talk. You're very fun to talk to. I really enjoyed it. Uh, well, you know, you try and make it easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, uh, no, you're fun. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. That's not always true <laughs> of uh, interviews. Um, yes, no, I will definitely stay in touch. Absolutely. Anything new comes up, mm -hmm. you hit us right up. We'll put you right on here. Sure will. And um, thanks for all your good work. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. There we had uh, Lynn Albright, the mother of Ross Albright, Silk Road. Uh, the website is freeross.org. Um, they have a, a free ross -a -thon coming up December 4th. Um, it's going to be eight hours long. You can find that too on freeross.org. Uh, a whole bunch of people are going to be on there. Uh, Adam Kokesh, uh, Alex Winter, who directed uh, Deep Web, Bob Murphy, um, Brian Dougherty, the senior editor of Reason Magazine, um, Ross's sister, uh, there's a ton of people on here, radio hosts, lobbyists, uh, Doug Casey, best-selling author of uh, Investment Advisor, uh, like about 30, 40 people, it's going to be an all-day long um, opportunity to get involved and see what's going on at uh, the free ross -thon. you can find out about it at freeross.org. I guess that's about it. You know, um, like I said, Lynn Albrecht could be my mother, you know. Uh, I was facing a lot of time, you know, 15 years in prison. And uh, there's a lot of guys I've, I've talked to that are sitting in prison right now that don't have a mother and a sister and a, and a TV movie out there helping them out and stuff like that. So it's a rough road when, you, when you, you know, you're on the wrong end of the federal government prosecuting you. Uh, and, you know, people see these old mafia guys, you know, they're walking around being wiretapped and, and they think, ah, you know, they deserve it. Ah, they live the life of crime. You know, uh, we all have our civil rights. Uh, when they could take away the rights from one person, they could take it away from any one of us. And the slippery slope, like you said, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, when we would get these cases, especially drug cases or any, any case involving a search, uh, the first thing you do is Fourth Amendment. Let's attack the search warrant. And now it's not even a consideration uh, that to even find a lawyer that's going to raise a Fourth Amendment to, to attack the search warrant uh, defense, to try and get, get the search warrant uh, thrown out, to try and get the search thrown out, the probable cause. All that is, uh, I don't even think these lawyers today even have a, a basic working knowledge of how to file those motions anymore. It's just all gone. 
So you hear people talking about when they ask Donald Trump, or you know, what do you what do you, what do you think about the Constitution? What kind of judges are you going to uh, appoint? The first thing they'll say, oh, the Second Amendment. I'm going to have judges that are defending the Second Amendment because the Second Amendment's under attack. When 99 percent of us in our life will never have an instance in our life that involves the Second Amendment. Um, most people have no trouble purchasing, buying, selling guns if they want. Um, and, you know, no matter all the hype, and there's really no attack on it in the future. But it's the Fourth Amendment that has been under attack for the past 30 years that most of us, if you have an issue with the courts, this is our defense. This is your big defense. That's the one that we can use, you know, to attack these search warrants, to attack the, these, um, even when they don't have warrants, to, to, to attack the evidence against this. This is what, you know, we need. This is what we should be concerned about. And I'll talk about it, you know. And then, of course, the First Amendment, you know, being able to come on the air here and talk to you, you know, the, without the, being silenced and uh, targeted by the government and silenced and shut up. <sighs> anyway, uh, Lynn Albrecht, mother of Ross Albrecht, Silk Road, uh, freeross.org, and you go to their Facebook page and show them some love over there at the uh, Free Ross community page. Uh, we'll be right back after these messages. And now a word from our sponsors. Did you know that 30% of all people on online dating websites and personal ads are either married or in a monogamous relationship. 30%. If you suspect that your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend may be cheating online, go to emailrevealer.com uh, on our online infidelity investigation. You give us their email address and we can trace it back to online personal ads, dating sites, and social networks. We can even expand the investigation and find them uh, cheating on uh, escort service sites uh, or even porn sites if they're registered to porn sites and swinger sites. Uh, so check out emailrevealer.com if you suspect your spouse is cheating and check out our online infidelity investigation. William Ramsey is a producer here at the Opperman Report and he's just come out with a new book. Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Now, he just sent me a copy of this book. Oh, boy, it's about two inches thick. And there's a chapter on just about everybody in this book uh, that you can imagine. Uh, the Beatles. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Jack Parsons. Uh, everybody's in here. It's incredible. Uh, and I definitely recommend this book. There's a, a, a bunch of pictures in here, too, uh, of all these people in uh, different chapters and, and uh, information. Uh, Anton LaVey and people I've never heard of, too. There's a whole bunch in here. JC, JFC Fuller. I don't know who he is. Uh, but, but it's great stuff uh, by our, ho our, our producer here, uh, William Ramsey. So check out Children of the Beast, Alistair Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com. Or you could find it in the Opperman Report uh, dot com bookstore. We have an urgent bulletin. Uh, it seems that the group Straw Man is still on the loose. It has been confirmed that Straw Man are, are Canadian, okay, and that uh, authorities are asking people to stay indoors. Lock your doors and windows until this group can be dealt with. You could find more information about this group, this group of Canadians, at strawmanmusic.com. You can have your ad played here. <laughs> okay. We're looking for sponsors. Okay, In fact, we desperately need sponsors right now to take this show to the next level. Uh, so you can... Have your advertised your ad uh, played here, read live, you know, like I'm doing now, so artfully, or we can even uh, work up a little jingle for you with some music and stuff like that and play it here. You have no idea how inexpensive it would be uh, to have your ad played on the Opperman Report on seven stations 
uh, live Friday night and another seven stations live on Saturday night, uh, plus replayed every day of the week on different stations and then archived on YouTube, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and all different kinds of podcasts, uh, Pod This and Pod Bean, all different kinds of places uh, who archive the show for us. Uh, and, and on those archives, uh, your, your ad would play indefinitely, forever. Uh, you also get a little uh, banner on OppermanReport.com. Uh, you get a mention on the air. You get a little interview on the air and all kinds of fun stuff. If you sponsor Opperman Report, we have an opportunity to get this show on a major AMFM station in California. We've been approved. Uh, so if you want to sponsor us into that, uh, so incredibly inexpensive that, that your ad would be heard uh, by a uh, – the, the, the range covers 5 million people in population uh, where your ad would be broadcast, and all these other uh, stations would be thrown in for free. Uh, so really uh, affordable prices to sponsor OppermanReport.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. You can get a copy of that book at emailrevealer.com, or you can get a copy of that book now. It's back up on Amazon.com, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator by Ed Opperman. And this book has been updated a little bit from the previous book that we had uh, that was available to our wonderful listeners. <laughs> 